Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Hmm, you're looking mighty fine in that suit there, Venom Fang. Why, thank you. Icy, would you mind telling our audience what we're going to be talking about this evening? Certainly. Today we're going to show you why billions of people throughout the world from every tribe, nation, and tongue have put their trust in Jesus Christ and the book we have come to call the Bible. Ladies and gentlemen, God has used this book for thousands of years to change people's lives, and He is still changing people's lives by the billions with this most fascinating text. Did you know that the Bible is the number one best-selling book of all time? I sure did, Icy. Venom Fang X and I believe that the Bible is the inspired, inerrant, and living word of the one and only God. And this video will help you to understand why we believe that and will help you to believe too. Hey, did you know that the Bible is not just one book? It's not? It may appear to be, but the Bible is actually a compilation, a volume of over 65 different books written over 3,000 years by over 40 different authors who lived lifetimes apart. Wow, that's incredible. In the whole world, is there any other books like that, Venom? Nope, not one. Not only that, it also contains some of the earliest writings in known history, as well as foreknowledge of the future and scientific facts that could not have been known at the time of writing. That's amazing. What else does it say? And who wrote it? Well, I'm glad you asked. Over 4,000 years ago, a man named Moses wrote five books, which we today call the Jewish Torah. These five books were called the books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. They were instructions to the Israelite people, who Moses helped free from the enslavement from Egypt by commandment of God, who also gave laws and a history of the creation of the world to these Jewish people living thousands of years ago, so that the Jewish nation called Israel could be established. Moses recorded what God had commanded him, and many of the instructions found in those five books were revolutionary for the time. Like what? Well, God wanted to keep the Israelite people extremely healthy and clean, so many practices were forbidden. Such as? Well, they were told not to eat pork or any animal that chews the cut or scavenger birds that feast upon rotting flesh. These animals we know today are generally unhealthy and carry much disease. However, many cultures in history had no apprehension to eating them. Not so long ago, science learned that eating undercooked pork caused serious infections and parasites. Now consider this, the Bible forbid the eating of pork more than 3,000 years before we learned how to cook pork safely. What else? God says that he hangs the earth on nothing. How could this have been known 3,000 years ago? In the book of Isaiah, God declares that the earth has a round shape and that the heavens, the universe, is constantly expanding. There's no way anyone could have known this 3,000 years ago. God also gave them certain hygienic laws, like to only wash your hands with running water, instead of in a basin like so much of the world did. Also, they were told to take a shovel and go outside their camp to use the toilet and bury their waste so to keep the germs outside the population. Hmm, isn't that common sense? Well, it, it is today, because we know how dangerous germs are, but even as recently as the Industrial Revolution, which was only a few decades ago, people were still dumping their waste inside major population zones, which caused massive amounts of disease and sickness. Oh, that's gross. God also forbid sexual promiscuity, which means sex was only allowed in marriage. This kept sexual disease to a minimum, and also upheld a higher moral standard that is sorely lacking in today's society. If only our society kept this law alone. Very true. AIDS and other sexual diseases have been on the rise, and teenage pregnancy rates have gone up 500% over the last 200 years. So, why did God keep the Jews clean? What was the purpose of this? Now that's a good question. God raised up this people, Israel, and established the nation in order to save the world. Save the world? How? And save it from what, Venom? 
When God created humankind, as the book of Genesis reveals, mankind used their free will in rebellion against God. So mankind was separated from God through their sins, which is why God has given mankind this Bible, so we could begin to return back to him and understand what he expects from us. What does this have to do with Israel and the Jews? Moses and other prophets under inspiration of God in the nation of Israel predicted the future when one would be born, a Jew, who would be the Messiah, who would die for our sins, be rejected by his own people, be raised from the dead, and bring the world by the billions into the knowledge and worship of the God of the Jews. Oh, Venom, you're speaking about Jesus Christ. That's right. Jesus was a Jewish man who lived 2,000 years ago. The word Christ in Greek is actually the Hebrew word for Mashiach, which means Messiah. So how can we know if Jesus is the promised Messiah? What if they just made up that story? Well, let's take a very close look at who this Messiah was meant to be. As I said before, the Bible is not just one book, it is many books. More than half of those books were written before Jesus was born, and they predicted his birth, his life, his death, his resurrection, and the impact that he would have on the world. Can you show me? Sure. The prophet Daniel said that the Messiah would come and die for our sins before the destruction of Solomon's temple, which was 2,000 years ago. So the Messiah had to have come already. So why would the Jews reject him? To answer the question why the Jews rejected their Messiah, we have to go back to the book of Genesis, which we were talking about earlier. In the book of Genesis, a man named Jacob was given a promise by God that his sons would become the twelve tribes of Israel. So those twelve sons had a brother named Joseph, and Joseph, even though he was one of their brothers, was rejected and despised and left for dead in a pit. Now the Egyptians came by and pulled Joseph out of the pit, and Joseph became became a prolific leader in Egypt and actually would later save the lives of his brothers. So we see in the ancestors of the Israelite people, we see the story of rejection and salvation. Even though they rejected one of their own, the one they rejected would later save their lives. And God did this in order for us to understand here in the future that Messiah's mission was very similar to the story of Joseph. So now what I want to do is actually look at Jewish scripture that was written before Jesus was born that the Jews to this day use, and yet they still do not see that Jesus is the Messiah. Isaiah, one of the Jewish prophets, wrote this. In Isaiah 7.14 he said, Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will be with child and will give birth to a son and will call his name Emmanuel. That word means God with us. Isaiah in the next chapter would say this, And he will be a sanctuary, but for both the houses of Israel he will be a stone that causes men to stumble and a rock that makes them fall. Isaiah would then go on to say this, For a child is born and a son is given and the government will be upon his shoulders and he will be called the Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Of the increase of his government and peace there will be no end and he will reign on David's throne. This one is the Messiah, the son of David. Now let's look at a few other prophecies. Isaiah would say this, Therefore, thus says the Lord, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a tested stone, a costly cornerstone, for the foundation, firmly placed. He who believes in him will not be disturbed. This reminds me of what Isaiah said about earlier, the rock that causes people to fall, the stone. Psalm 118 says, This is the gate of the Lord, through which the righteous may enter. I will give you thanks, for you answered me. You have become my salvation. The stone that the builders rejected has become the capstone. The Lord has done this, and it is marvelous in our eyes. That reminds me of when Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the door, just as God prophesied that this Messiah, this rejected capstone, would be the gate which the righteous may enter through. Zechariah wrote this, Rejoice greatly, O Zion! Shout in triumph, O daughters of Jerusalem! Behold, your king is coming to you. This is the king, King David, the Messiah. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt. So Jesus came riding on a donkey into Jerusalem with salvation. Zechariah went on and said this, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, and against the man who is my associate, declares the Lord. Strike this shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. 
When Israel rejected Jesus, their city was destroyed, their temple was destroyed. Just as the prophet Daniel said that the Messiah would come before the destruction of the temple, be rejected, and then salvation would go to the ends of the world. Isaiah would go on to say that through this suffering servant, through the suffering Messiah, through his death and resurrection from the dead, that salvation would come to the ends of the world. This is why the Messiah had to be rejected, so that he could die for our sins and that the knowledge of him could go throughout the entire world. Isaiah 53 is probably the most famous passage in all of the Bible. It speaks about the Messiah who would be the salvation to the nations of the world, who would be bruised and beaten and killed and rejected by his own people, but make atonement for the sins of the world. The Bible teaches if you will repent and put your faith, your trust in Jesus Christ, believing in your heart that he is God himself who became a man and died on a cross to take the penalty for your sins and was raised from the dead on the third day, is alive and hears your prayers. If you will ask him to forgive you and save you right now, the Bible promises you everlasting life. Well, guys, I hope you really think about the things we've talked about here today and turn away from your sins and trust in Jesus Christ who died to save you and me and everyone else.